Okay, let's get started. Um, thanks everyone for coming. This is the third of the public sector webinar series. So it's really great to see some of the same names as the, as the last few sessions. Uh, this one I think is gonna be some really great content for all of you. So it's about storytelling around your emission, um, emissions. We have uh, Austin from Toy2 speaking as well as he Helen and Debbie from counties. Helen and Debbie have been a part of the County's Manukau District Health Board's emissions reduction journey since 2012. Um, I'll do a bit more of an intro on them in a second, but Austin, if you could just switch to the next slide. Um, just some housekeeping. We'll do some question and, um, question and answer at the very end, and then this is also recorded. So if anyone wants to refer back to this or share it with their colleagues, you're more than welcome to do that. You'll get an email with the recording after, as well as the resources. So the presentation and any other um, references that we'll talk about throughout. Um, also, if you go to the next slide, I'll just do a quick intro to Austin. Um, she helps Torture EnviroCare and its clients tell their sustainability stories, and she has a background in technical writing and education and currently works on our marketing team, supporting our customers in their communications as well as working to improve their ongoing experience in our program. So I'll let Austin kick it off and then we'll go to Helen and Debbie a bit later on. Thanks. Great. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. Right. Um, so today I'd like to start with a bit of information around building a narrative out of your emissions, sort of why and how you should tell the story. We'll then turn to how that story can support engagement with your staff, your stakeholders, your constituents and users. And then we'll chat a little bit about how you can deal with fluctuations in your emissions. And throughout, I'll show off some initiatives um, in action. Here we go. There you go. Now you can see my face. Um, I'll show off some initiatives in action. And um, of course, remember, we have time for questions and discussion at the end. Um, throw questions in the QA box in the meantime, if you'd like. All right. So let's start with why you should build a narrative. Um, we share a common goal of net zero New Zealand by 2050. This means we have a lot of carbon to reduce. Um, as an example, if we look at a major piece of our profile, transport and energy, there's many pathways for reduction here. There's energy reductions might mean using different tools, electric vehicles, wood chip boilers, um, more efficient appliances. Reductions can also mean changing behaviors, things like driving less, shipping slower via sea or rail instead of quickly by air. Whether you're changing the way we do things or the tools we use, we need engagement. Engagement's gonna help you win your investment case to change your heating source, change your vehicle fleet. It'll help you shift behaviors so more staff are commuting together or by bike. It'll help lock in public opinion behind your strategic plans and your policies, which is gonna to continue to allow that momentum to build. Engagement means at its heart sort of telling people a story, but ideally doing so as a dialogue. So rather than thinking about this as disseminating or broadcasting information, think about it more as a process of back and forth, um, focused by a personalized story, but a dialogue. That is really uh, at the core of how you can engage people and um, importantly, change behaviors and minds. If you think about the work that you guys are already doing around preparing, say, a 10-year plan or a strategy, um, an annual document, there's a lot of facts, there's a lot of data underpinning it, there's a lot of individual projects and plans, but when you're presenting it to the public or presenting it to your board, your counselors, that overall document has a single concept that sort of serves as an umbrella to cover that wide, diverse group of projects and requirements. That umbrella is going to create a a narrative essentially, a cohesive coordinated message to make it more effective. And then taking it that next step further is to turn it into a dialogue, a process of engagement. And then how do we do this? So the first step is to know who you're talking to. You might be presenting your results to your counselors or your board. They need to know, um, they need to know the information that they require to make an informed decision on the policy, on budgets. They're acting on behalf of stakeholders and constituents. So that's one sort of potential audience. Another audience might be your colleagues sharing your initiatives with them. They need to know the work that you're doing, the work that you're planning, how it impacts them, but also how they can get involved. And it's important also for your colleagues to know what they should be communicating in their own roles to the audiences that they speak to. So that might be your comms team, but it also might be a receptionist or a contractor. 
And finally, your constituents, your users, they need to know what you're doing for them. And uh, I'm sure you're all well aware that they would like to know how it is costing them or saving them as well. So once you figure out who are you talking to right now, you next step is to find some shared values. And I've got six things up here that uh, cover pretty much all of us uh, to some degree or another. Almost everyone can find a way to relate to at least one of these things. So these are um, essentially these are sort of narratives that you can tell based on those core values and the shared values that you have. Financial sustainability. So looking at things like um, current wealth, looking at costs and cost savings, but also framing a narrative in terms of investing in their future, thinking of positioning things as an investment, um, as well as preserving wealth now independence and freedom of choice. Uh, people really want to know that they have the power to make their own decisions. They have that independence. They can sort of do what they want to do. And so you can frame your narrative as a way of, look, if we do these things now, it's going to preserve your independence and your freedom of choice going forward. Um, if we don't do these things for around carbon reduction, uh, you're going to get a lot more limits in the future because it's going to be a very different world that we're going to live in. Uh, common sense, keeping things practical. Uh, a lot of people relate to this one. It's um, in some ways, it's very much common sense to do things like reduce pollution, clean up our air, uh, use less energy and save money. So that can be a really helpful way to frame your story. Aspirations, thinking about what is our ideal 2030? What's about our ideal 2050? What could these things look like? Help creating a shared aspirational vision that's worth working towards. Um, you can think back to lockdown and everyone was really enjoying things like the clean air and the bird song, enjoying walks with the family, save time by not commuting. Um, while lockdown was very hard in a lot of ways, taking some of those things that really resonated with so many people and thinking about, okay, what does a 2030 look like where that quality of life is every day and we're also let out of our houses? Um, so preserving the status quo, you might have a much more conservative audience and they don't like change. Preserving the status quo uh, can be a great narrative here because taking you know, bits of action, working on carbon reduction now is going to mean that our future looks a lot closer to our present. Um, if we don't take action now and carbon does not get reduced, our future is going to look quite different. And so this is a good way to kind of position that for those who are a little bit more reluctant to change. And for almost everyone, quality of life, health, well-being, the local environment that everyone likes to enjoy, their friends, their family, this is a great way to, to frame a narrative around the co-benefits of these things. It's very strong motivators. So once you look at your, you know who you're talking to right now, you found some shared values and figured out what could that narrative look like based on those shared values, then you can shape the narrative itself. So that might look like showcasing investment opportunities, uh, guiding them to visualize that low carbon future, and then potentially gently contrasted with the one, the future we don't want, um, demonstrating that impact of not doing anything. You can highlight the quality of life benefits, looking at the values, beliefs, and worldviews in common, using these to frame that narrative, focusing on those co-benefits, things like health, well-being, energy security, financial sustainability, the local environment. Overall, you wanna provide solutions and practical steps. You wanna keep it anchored in common sense so it's not ever perceived as an agenda. Uh, frame it as an investment in one's future and keep to the broader meaning of sustainability. So it doesn't necessarily have to be just about environmental sustainability or social sustainability, but financial sustainability is a really great, great way to get things in um, and, and framing it as that investment and that uh, keeping the cost of living and, and keeping rates and so forth, um, keeping the cost of doing business all quite sustainable. And overall, keep it positive um, rather than overly focusing on the threats. So it's less about a doom and gloom message and more about what is that hopeful thing that we want to achieve instead. So if you think about the way that you're already preparing things like your um, draft plans, consulting with your constituents, how are you already producing these future oriented stories to get your audience to see your proposals desirable as the future they want to create this shared vision for the future? 
So here's a few um, snippets from Auckland's um, the Auckland Plan 2050, which is a interactive digital website to present the plan. It allows users to find their own path based on their priorities, based on the narrative that they want to tell themselves. You can click through to different outcomes, click down below there, you can click through to different directions, different focus areas, there's dashboards, there's links. It's very interactive and it allows the users to find the information that they want and the level of detail that they want. So things like this, you guys are already, the public sector is very good at communicating to the public by nature. And so this is really, this is old hat to you guys. It's just kind of thinking about how can you take the lessons that you already know really well and just apply them to carbon reduction. Um, now, once you've worked out your narrative, there's a few things about uh, how to work on transforming that into building the engagement. And the very first rule that I'd like to emphasize is communicate often. Keep the communications coming, provide regular updates so it stays in mind. They don't have to be big major updates every time. They can be just a little social post here and there. Um, it can make sure that it's always on an agenda for a public meeting, anything like that. But focusing on those positive motivations and those co-benefits, the aspirations, tying it back to practical specifics, practical actions and results. Um, but just at the end of the day, just keep talking about it, keep it coming, drip feed it in little bits and pieces. Um, so the Gen Less campaign, um, they're everywhere right now. They're doing a really strong push on TV, on social media, but it doesn't even have to be a strong, big, major campaign. Just, you know, look at your existing social media channels. How are you already reaching those people? And how can you make sure that you're adding, you know, a tweet in every, every month, once a month on what's going on, something related to your carbon reduction plans, your projects, that kind of thing. Uh, Think about the, the strategies that you're presenting and you have consultation meetings with the public or informational sessions. How can you make sure that carbon reduction is a part of each of those sessions? And you're gonna hear back directly from your audience. That's one nice thing about some of these more uh, dialogue-based channels, things like social media and um, public meetings. So the second rule is to meet your audience where they are and keep it relatable and applicable, telling it in their terms. So this might mean that you're going to end up with a very different executive summary that you present to your counselors or your board uh, compared to what you're going to present to your communications colleagues so that they can be doing those social media updates for you um, or what you're going to tell the constituents at a public meeting. Those can be three very different narratives. And throughout, you can signpost, you know, this is where to find more information for those that are curious, um, those that are really keen on some specific data, but you can focus on the bits of the story that apply to them most and use that data to anchor your story rather than expecting it to be the story. So for example here, rather than talking about the scopes, you know, my scope one and two emissions were this and we've reduced them by this much money, or sorry, this much, uh, this many tons. Rather than talking about that, talk about the activities that you've done. You know, we've flown less, we've used less energy or translate them as Auckland District Health Board has done here from their website, translate them into something that's uh, a little bit more comparable. So we've, um, the savings are equivalent to burning 12,000 tons of coal. Um, it's still a little bit, it's such a big number, it's hard to relate to, right? But 12,000 tons of coal is a lot easier to visualize than, um, you know, 20% of carbon emissions at 28%. So putting it in terms that they understand, putting using that data to create a map of risks and opportunities, these sorts of things uh, help you just tell the story in a way that relates to people, include infographics, include photos, tables, charts, lots of different ways to access that information. Finally, the third rule, provide opportunities to participate at every possible moment. This is an engaging dialogue. So at every point, you can make it a dialogue, have that back and forth, try and do so. You guys do this already really well. Um, and it can be as simple as things like providing a space to provide suggestions, getting that dialogue, you're gonna hear directly what matters to your, um, to your audience and they can respond, you know exactly how you can address that issue going forward for them. Um, providing some resources. So this might mean giving your staff a bit of time resource where everyone goes off, they calculate their impacts at home using a household calculator, maybe start up a bit of a friendly competition to see who can reduce their impacts the most. 
things like um, I've seen some recent stuff on social media where uh, some of the councils are putting gold stickers on the recycling bins of those who are doing it right. And those people are very excited to have gotten the gold sticker. They're sharing it with their friends and family. It's going to help inspire that change and starting the communication um, among themselves, among that community. Uh, Councils have worked with facilitating neighborhoods. How can they take action collectively for resilience? Those sorts of things. Providing those big and small moments of education and participation. And even for larger investment projects, there's still a lot of opportunities. So thinking about you know, a major project to shift behavior away from driving and parking in the city to instead using public transport, using cycling um, routes. So what can your audience do right now? What can you ask them? How do you ask them to participate right now? How can you get feedback on their barriers for why they aren't doing those things right now and take those barriers and specifically put them in your plans and report back to your, your users here. This is what I'd like you to do right now. This is how we're going to make it easier for you going forward, that kind of thing. Just it becomes a dialogue. It becomes a conversation. And again, you guys know this all really well. It's something that the public sector it's it's part of being a public servant, isn't it? So these are things that you guys know. It's just a matter of, of bringing more of that carbon reduction into those messages you're already sharing. Um, so a little bit about how to talk about fluctuations. Uh, I think it's important to acknowledge that fluctuations happen to all of us, even the, the experts. Um, sustainability is very much about progress, not about perfection. If we all tried to do it perfectly, no one would get anywhere. Um, if we can all do a little bit imperfectly, it's going to get us there in the end. Um, and in every story, whether it's a story in a Hollywood movie or a story we tell ourselves about our daily lives, there's always ups and downs and setbacks. And it's true of carbon reduction too. So by bringing those fluctuations, those setbacks into your story, it just makes it feel more real and relatable for people. It makes, um, it builds trust because you're clearly being honest. So it is really important to include those things. That said, you can focus on the future and the overall story and the plans rather than focusing and highlighting those setbacks. So acknowledge them, they happened, it's disappointing. Here's what we're going to try next instead because we weren't able to reduce the emissions in this way, we're gonna try a new project or we've set up a new policy or we've, um, we've set up this other plan for how we're going to do it better going forward and try that. And maybe that won't work either. And we'll try again something else. And that just keeping it honest and keeping it updated is going to help build that trust with your audience. Um, and throughout, you know, just reemphasize that overall shared narrative, those co-benefits that you've already set up with your audience and how can they participate. So a few just kind of examples here, thinking about landfill for councils. Um, if, if it's a council owned landfill, that might be a major part of your wider emissions. And so how can you look at that, uh, reducing that when it's probably going up for a lot of councils? So focusing on how your communities can divert more from landfill in a way that benefits them, things like food waste and saving money or supporting the local farmers, telling a nice story there, eating better for better health, those sorts of things. Could be a chance to talk about your plans to roll out organic collections or highlight you know, the existing organics program. It might be a chance just to educate on the limits of domestic recycling in New Zealand and some alternatives that people can do to avoid that packaging in the first place, or even just a gold sticker on their recycling bin if they're doing it right. Um, these things might help change that behavior so that over time, those landfill emissions can start going down. Um, maybe energy is the big source you're working on. Um, you need uh, investment to change away from coal boilers. So it might be a story of health and well-being. It might be a story about financial sustainability, um, using wood chips and supporting an income stream for that local forestry. Transportation, it could be um, you know, a really good focus for a common sense, practical narrative around saving resources. Um, can also tick that financial sustainability box. Um, but avoiding transport, then maybe you can focus more on things like well-being. So by not flying during COVID-19, the lockdown, I think a lot of people started to realize just how much their health and well-being benefited from not traveling regularly. It can be quite exhausting for those who do travel a lot. And so thinking about that as part of the aspirational future, how can we take those things from lockdown that we liked and build them into that shared goal um, going forward? Uh, and I suppose counterintuitive, uh, on the, the other side of things, um, a lot of people suffered from inter lack of interaction during the lockdown. And so they wanna be face-to-face -face more. How is the narrative then about changing behaviors 
and transport types or cutting back elsewhere to balance so that we can still get together, we can still see each other, but we're reducing those air travel footprints. So um, it's, it's a balance, it's give and take, it's about progress, not perfection, and focusing, always focusing back on that future and that narrative. Um, celebrate your wins, be honest when things go backwards, um, but just keep reemphasizing that narrative and the shared motivations and just remind yourself progress, not perfection. It's a very helpful thing there. Um, now on the next slide, I've got a few example resources here. And so you will get these in the slide pack that we're gonna share later, just some places for inspiration. You know, remember that the public sector is already really good at communicating to the public and to your counselors and to your boards. So this is no different than, than that. You guys already know really well what you're doing, but I've grabbed a few things to, to inspire you there and a, a few things that aren't public sector. So some data rich storytelling that does a really nice job of, of presenting the story. Um, the spinoffs 100 year forecast, for example, the E uh, environmentalist, they have some great infographics and some comms champions don't ignore the business sector um, or the nonprofit sector. They're doing good work in the communications area as well that you can definitely borrow from. So thank you. That's that's me, Kenzie, back to you. Cool. Thanks so much, Austin. That was amazing content. I think it was would be really helpful to everyone. And again, we'll send a recording of this around. So you're welcome to pass it along to your colleagues. I think um, it'll be really useful information for everyone. Helen, thanks so much for joining. I know you have a very busy day today. Um, just a bit of an intro on Helen. She just recently is starting her sustainability manager role at Counties, but Counties has been a member of Carbon Reduce since 20, uh, 2012, and they've really set the bar for the public sector and health sector on climate action with a number of initiatives over waste and overall, overall carbon reduction. Um, Helen was born and raised in rural Waikato region, uh, where growing her own food for the table um, making use of surplus was second nature, so sustainability and environmental care have really been a passion of hers for a really long time, a way before it was even a, had a label or was trendy in a way. Um, Helen's previous career path was as a registered nurse, where she witnessed years of uh, wasted resources, and her current role allows her to mix her healthcare and environmental management knowledge together and continue the work that Debbie Wilson has commenced with counties. So I'll leave it over to you, Helen, and yeah. Thanks very much, Kenzie, for that lovely introduction. Um, hi, everybody. I've come in on the latter half of the session purely because my predecessor, Debbie Wilson, is spending the day with me doing a handover, and I have like four pages to go through, so time is of an essence, but it's really lovely to be able to spend some time talking to you all. I'll just, um, just get my um, presentation up for you. Um, are you all seeing that okay? I can't see thumbs up or anything. I just, just have to hear. Not yet, Helen. Yeah, okay. Yet. I can always share it for you if you need. Hey, if you could share it, Kenzie, that would be great. I'm not quite yeah. sure. No worries. Just give me one second. I'll pull it up. Anyone got you on? So you have to end the slideshow. You're on Zoom or Teams? Yeah, Zoom. Okay, so. You go onto your Zoom and then you should have. Wait, you actually want to go onto the one that you're in? Oh, look, share screen. There you go. So click on share. There we go. Yeah. Cool. That's perfect. Is that so you or me that's put it up there? Yeah. All good. All right. Sorry about that, folks. Um, first of all, I just want to say thank you for that introduction, Kenzie. And uh, just to explain a little bit of history of myself, this is my the beginning of my third week here. 
So I've worked in County of Manukau previous to that, but I, um, uh, Debbie's here if I need some backup with the questions that you might answer me in case I don't have full details. So um, just to carry on with the presentation, um, Debbie Wilson was the first um, sustainability manager here at Counties Manukau, and she started in 2012 and really got the ball rolling with um, Enviromark, which used to be Totoi, and um, started off the first audit and the baseline man manage a measurement virtually as soon as she started in the role. So we got the ball rolling in 2012. Um, <clears throat> our initial target was to reduce our emissions by 20% in 2017 and we were very, very happy that we managed to beat that target and got in at 21.3, so that was fantastic and that was due to a lot of hard work by Debbie and other people within the organisation. Um, since then, Counties Manukau has been lucky enough or fortunate or has worked hard enough to, to win several awards for for their carbon emissions tracking. And um, I'm not taking credit for that myself. And there's a lot of hard work from a lot of different people within the organization. Um, and I just hope that that continues. And it's not a blow our own trumpet, but I think um, DHBs are very good at keeping their light under a bushel. And I think it's quite good to advertise that DHBs are quite capable of doing really great things. So, forget about the history and start carrying on about what the future reveals for us. And the targets that have been set for Counties Manukau is, as you can see on the screen. And what I'd like to see um, happening with the, up to, from now to 2025, is the ability to set some smaller, more specific steps. And um, some of you may be aware that the climate Commission panel is going to be being, being put out some recommendations in February. And we're hoping that we may be able to utilize some of those recommendations to put some structure into our smaller, more finite, finite strategies between now and 2025. On the screen now, you can see the top 10 carbon reducers and counties, Manukau was one of them, but I would like to give um, credence to the other people who were also the other nine. So we've got Capital Coast District Council, we've got the Auckland District Health Board, Canterbury District Health Board, the University of Canterbury, Frucor, um, Freightways, Antarctica New Zealand, Palmerston North DHB and Hawke's Bay DHB. So there's four DHBs in there and several district councils, which is very encouraging. And I think that all of those organizations have a great um, place to play as far as role modeling. And role modeling is, is very dear to my heart because I believe that if large organizations such as DHBs, hospitality, education facilities can role model the correct behavior, then that, that spirals down into households and every little bit makes a difference. <clears throat> and I heard on the radio last year, something that really struck home with me was the fact that often people go, oh, I'm only one person and what can I do? But the thing is that, that small things done by individuals actually have a big impact. And the reason for that is that if you have your local MPs or politicians seeing that individuals are actually making an impact in their own little community, it gives MPs and politicians a wee bit more courage and um, support to go forward and put through um, recommendations that have a more uh, wider impact. So individuals making small changes are important and it should be done and we should be encouraging it. So um, I was asked to talk a little bit about community, commun communicating the emissions journey. And I think um, all of you will have different ways that you will do this within your organizations and every organization has a different culture. So it depends very much on where you work and um, <clears throat> how receptive your audience is and in what ways they like to learn. But here we have 
um, started off by raising awareness. So um, uh, Debbie started an electronic newsletter. There was lots of notices in the what we call the Daily Dose, which is an online, excuse me, um, on screen sort of small snippets of what's going on around the hospital for clinical staff and admin staff to be able to read quickly. So there was lots of information in that. Um, we also made sure that um, targets, the commission, the carbon emissions reductions, targets were inserted into the strategic plan for counties Manukau, so that, that um, emission journey was communicated right up to the executive leadership team and down from there so that there was a clear message about what we, where we were heading towards. The internal communications, I've touched on that actually, it was um, uh, newsletters, um, computer screen messages, um, and we also had um, our comms team putting things um, during various times onto the screen as well. Lots of photos, lots of little stories. Storytelling does really well. Um, concentrating on maybe a green team in a particular area, doing a little story on them, communicating with the rest of the hospital, what was going on, what they were doing, how they achieved it. Uh, talking about some of um, Debbie's presentations that she was doing in conferences around the world and nationwide, and just raising the whole awareness that Counties Manukau was concentrating on our emissions and that we were serious about it. Um, Debbie organised a lot of events within the hospital that were in conjunction with Auckland Regional Council or with Auckland Transport, such as um, bike events during the February Bike Challenge. And in November, uh, the Auckland Walking Challenge was quite um, highly advertised and diff different areas and different regions will have different challenges that come up and these are the sort of things that can be linked into um, connecting with your carbon footprint. So in the month of February, if we are encouraging active transport and doing bike workshops, then you can also advertise the fact that by using your bike or walking to work or for a leisure activity reduces the amount of carbon emissions that your car is is um, emitting. So there's all sorts of those sort of links that are really important. Things like um, we were looking at, at the dietary intake in the hospital and meatless Mondays and things like that, which hasn't quite got off the ground. But things like that advertises the fact to, to staff and to visitors and to patients that there is a link between what you eat and carbon emissions. And all of that is educational. Celebrating success is really, really important. I've mentioned before that um, hiding your light under a bushel is not, is not the way to go in this realm. We really want to celebrate our successes. Sometimes successes might not be full successes. We may not have reached the target that we wanted, but some success should be always celebrated. And we go to the point of um, <clears throat> Little green teams around the different departments in the hospital put on afternoon teas or morning teas to say thank you to their staff for doing a great job with minimising their waste or recycling and um, highlighting how that has had an impact on the overall emissions within the hospital. And although it, it's hard to say, for example, theatre made this much difference to the emissions, to, to highlight the fact that the overall emissions have dropped and that you have been part of it is an important part for green teams to understand and feel good about. Um, <clears throat> the emissions journey, as you would appreciate, there is a lot of different segments to uh, reducing your carbon emissions and uh, Counties Manukau, much like many other large organisations, have focused largely on waste, transport and energy because of those are the areas that have quite a large impact and that we can um, get successes quickly in and work on more long-term issues as well. One of the things that we're looking at this year is to put in the climate change risks into our risk assessment and I've had a few chats about doing this this year and that may also um, communicate our emissions journey in a 
different manner to the executive leadership team because they look at things that are in our risk assessment agenda. And if we can highlight the fact that climate change is causing air pollution, um, a risk with overheating, uh, a risk with flooding in low-lying areas, then that also brings the environmental emission journey further up the agenda. Lots and lots of different internal initiatives, and I've just I've just listed a few here. Um, quite happy to talk about some more or share um, on a email basis with people that want to know a little bit more. So if we quite a lot on travel plans and travel engagement, getting people thinking about um, active transport, walking and cycling, taking public transport more. We're very, very lucky here at Counties Manukau. We have a train station right outside our front door. Um, it, it runs mostly uh, north to south, so it, it services a large portion of our staff and visitors, but not all of them. So we still have other things to work on with the east to west access. Uh, we run quite a few travel engagement events throughout the year to encourage people to use public transport and to talk about different um, ride sharing options and different ways that they can get to and fro work. Granted that when you're doing shift work and you're finishing very early in the morning or late at night, this becomes a little bit trickier. We have issues with <clears throat> like everywhere that you want your staff and your patients and your visitors to travel safely. Auckland Transport have worked really hard on doing this within Auckland and have it, simply by instigating ticket barriers has made uh, travelling on train much pleasanter because you have less ride hoppers and people jumping on and off. So gradually and slowly it is happening. Uh, stations are becoming newer, more br brightly lit, um, more enticing. It's easier for people to cycle to a train station and then get on a train. So the hubs are, are gradually growing and becoming more user-friendly. And um, from a county's Manukau DHB perspective, we have um, a travel better group in, in within our hospital and we have representatives that go to the uh, required meetings to represent travel better from a county's Manukau point of view. And from our community, we, we represent our local community and population. Um, waste minimisation, I think that's probably something that's um, very important to all organisations and people will do it differently. I'm very proud that we do a great recycling job here, but really I guess recycling, like you all know, is the tip of the iceberg. What we really want to do is minimise our waste as much as possible and not have all that stuff to recycle. Within a hospital, there's only so, so much that you can minimise your waste and you do have to find a way to recycle what's, what's left. Um, <clears throat> procurement principles are always a bit tricky and I'm sure you'll all understand that. Um, <clears throat> procurement in any organisation can sometimes be quite conv convoluted and it feels clunky and slow moving when you just want to replace one thing with another thing because it's a better thing. It's not always that simple, um, but work closely with your procurement team. They understand what you're trying to do, then it becomes a bit easier. And um, if you understand the barriers and obstacles that the procurement team are also facing, then it helps you both to problem solve. So yeah, just keep on that bandwagon. Toner recycling, we um, set up a system with Xerox so that our toners get taken away and not put into landfill. And worm farms is the last thing that I'd like to talk about in this list of initiatives. And really, uh, there are more, as I said before, but this is just a short list, just to get people's thought processes going. Um, worm farms have been set up in um, some of our satellite areas to take our organic waste. And organic waste within the hospital is a huge amount of waste. and we are constantly looking at ways that we could improve uh, this process and uh, certainly we've done these little trial areas and satellite places where it's a bit easier to control the waste and where it goes and 
um, make sure that it's clean and not contaminated. Um, the worm farms um, in one of our sites actually goes into a collaboration with a local high school who do horticultural classes. So our food waste goes into the worm farms, the worm farms turn that into compost and worm tea, and that then goes into the high school gardens, which in the last part of that cycle, which isn't happening yet, but we would like to see well, to be honest, the schools are sharing the food that they're growing with their school community and their whanau within the school. But we would really like to see that circle back and um, maybe become a, a big circle with the hospital and that we can get fresh fresh produce back into the hospital. But um, you will understand that there's contracts involved and there's a lot of process to be put in place before that full circle can happen but I'm pleased to say that the start of that circle has happened and it's get about getting people to understand those circles of life and to get on board and to catch the vision as well and tell a story so that people can understand what you're getting at. Um, with any of these initiatives we usually start small and maybe trial it in one little area. It's really important to do an audit um, before you start something so that you've got something to measure it against when you've finished. And um, so it's a plan, do, study, act type cycle. And there's lots of those sort of cycles that different organisations will know. But I've certainly le learned um, from my days when I was an RN and instigating a process but actually it's really disappointing if you don't do your audit beforehand because then you can't you can't say categorically what your success has been. So really encourage people to, no doubt, no matter how enthusiastic you may have people that want to start something, just, just spend a week or two doing a pre-audit first. That's really important. So staff engagement. Staff are wonderful, wonderful people and you can't underestimate how important they are. <clears throat> like, it, like it says in the red there, that you're, they're your biggest ambassadors and they have great ideas and they often um, are the ones that lead the charge. So let them come to you with ideas. Some ideas may not be terribly practical. Some ideas you can pick bits out of. Some ideas are fantastic. So just receive all and then take it from there. Um, from, the, from the top down, it's important, obviously, with any large organisation that you have an understanding with your executive leadership team or the parallel of, and that they get some buy-in and they understand the importance of measuring your carbon emissions and thereby reducing them. Um, sometimes, depending on the organisation, this is quite a lot of hard work to get them on board, but definitely have to work at that and get them on board. We have had a good success with our executive leadership team and they're happy for us to have um, carbon emissions targets written into our um, strategy but a lot of that was hard work by Debbie to get that off the ground so um, yeah uh, sometimes it's hard and sometimes it's easy. We also are very fortunate within Counties Manukau to have an environmental advisory group. Now this is made up of some management people, some clinicians, some um, people from theatre, anaesthetists, we've got some radiologists, consultants, um, a wide range of people of, <clears throat> from different stakeholder groups who are interested in environmental management. So it started up as, as an interest group of people that wanted to see Counties Manukau doing something better with their environment. When Debbie came on board, she made it more formal. So they are now a, an advisory group for the sustainability manager to go to, ha get help with policies, get help with direction, ask advice of, but also they pull in ideas from their different areas and um, departments. So um, if you don't have a group like this already in your organisation, I would really encourage you to try and get this together because they are a good stepping stone up to the ELT or up to that higher level. Level. And they're also a good stepping stone to gather ideas from people on the floor who may not have time to attend meetings. 
and it's a really nice support system. So that level of staff engagement is really, really beneficial. And then I've got here hotspots within, within departments. Now we uh, all have within our organisations people who are very environmentally aware, who or call themselves green or who want to get involved in something that may not have because of their primary clinical um, <clears throat> requirements, might not have the time to attend the meetings or go to everything that the environmental advisory group go to. So these people need to be collected together and if you can encourage them to collect like-minded to people together in a particular department and you, you grow a hotspot, then that group of people will come up with their own ideas. They'll come up with um, ways of doing things that are different, that are more sustainable or that are environmentally friendly. And then they feed back to the sustainability manager. So it really makes the job of a sustainability manager more supported um, and also more widespread. And once again, if you've got these hotspots and you've got people engaged and interested in where they're working, what they're doing, then you get lots more buy-in and just the message spreads so much faster. So why do we want to have staff engagement? Well, I mean, the writing's on the wall really, isn't it? If, if you've got people that are passionate and excited and enthusiastic about what they're doing, then uh, you're going to get more buy-in and more things are going to happen. So um, it's been proven that if people are working somewhere where they're proud of and that they're happy to work and they feel like they're doing the right thing, then it increases staff morale and you get better job satisfaction. And that is uh, beneficial for everybody in the organisation. Um, as I said before on the last slide, that if people have a green team or a hotspot, then they'll often take responsibility for their own area of work. And this is beneficial because often people that work in a particular area know a lot more about what could be done or what needs to be changed than someone like a sustainability manager who may not have that much detailed knowledge about working in that area. So that is why... Um, having people in hotspots all around the departments is really important. And I think this would work not just in DHBs, but in district councils or universities or, or whatever the organisation is. If it's a large organisation, then you need little hotspots everywhere to sort of keep everyone connected. Um, none of this work is possible and none of these Successes are actually entirely one organisation. It's usually a lot of collaboration. And <clears throat> obviously, Toy Two, used to be Enviromark, has been a major stakeholder in Counties of Manukau's successes. We've got Becca and we've got Eka. Now, when I first started, all of these abbreviations were quite confusing for me. Um, Becca is I'm not actually sure what BECA stands for, but it's an engineering consultancy. And they have all sorts of great initiatives and ideas that you can tune into. ECA is, of course, the Energy and Efficiency and Conservation Authority. And they can provide funding and they also do reports for organisations. So they are a great resource as well. Auckland Transport, we work quite closely with and other organisations in Auckland would of course do so, but in other regions you would have um, maybe an arm um, of the regional council that would do the transportation segments for you. And with us it's Auckland Regional Council, but as I say around the rest of the nation there'll be other parallel organisations. And then there are other organisations that do do funding or can offer support in other ways. And um, I can help you or other sustainability managers and different organisations can help with advice on where you can find extra funding for different topics and different projects that you might want to do. So moving forward, we want to be carbon neutral by 2050 as most of New Zealand do, I believe. And from our perspective, I would highly recommend, recommend the CMARS program with Toy2. And it's interesting to note that just last week, the Association of Salaried Medical Specialists um, met for their annual conference and they um, passed a resolution that they recommended that every DHV within New Zealand uh, should benefit from Toy2 
Poitou membership. So that would be a, a great step forward for DHBs because it's useful to have a tool where you're measuring apples with apples and you're not all being measured on a, a different audit tool. So um, that's a great thing and a good thing to look forward to in the future. Now, I believe that, yep, that's about my half hour up. So I'm very happy to take questions. And as I said before, if I've got some questions coming that are a bit tricky for me, I can refer to my good colleague, Debbie Wilson. Thank you very much. That was great. Thanks so much, Helen. If anyone has any questions, could you just pop them down into the Q&A box, please? We have five minutes left. So if you have any questions for either Austin or Helen, um, shoot them through now. I'll actually fire off a question. Um, this one's for both of you. What would you say is the biggest roadblock for an organization? So Austin, for an organization in general, and then Helen, what would be your um, county's biggest roadblock in making further pro progress for climate action? Oh, um, putting you on the spot, sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, I think, well, if I look at ourselves, for example, um, for Toy 2's emission profile, our biggest obstacle is air travel. It's part of our business model is that we're going and traveling to visit all of our clients and as part of their audit. And it's always been something that we've really struggled to figure out how do we how do we get around that and how are we going to reduce our emissions appropriately? And um, this is one of the ways that the lockdown helped us is that it, we had to shift business practices rapidly and uh, we sort of were able to realize what we could do in place of that. And so working on reducing things and how do we lock those in going forward? And so I think it's it can be really difficult to make a radical shift in the way you do business or to get investment and get your team behind wanting to do something completely differently. And um, while I we don't wish lockdowns on anyone over ever again, if we can avoid it, um, one way to do that is to take sort of, um, as with, with Helen's example, where you, you're trying things really small first. So come up with an idea that is a completely radical different way of doing it and test it really small and see how that works and refine that. And then once you've got it, pretty close and you think it's going to work, then you have a really strong business case to roll it out more widely. Cool, super interesting. Thanks. Helen? Oh, oh you're on no. mute. <laughs> Bearing in mind, I've only been here three weeks. Um, <laughs> one of the things that I have observed in my three weeks here is that um, County's Manukau is growing quite rapidly and we have got a project called um, Manukau, Grow Manukau, which is looking at a site out in uh, South Auckland to expand a bit more, to have more inpatient space and outpatient space for people to come into. And there's also something called the Middlemore Precinct, which is a housing development around the Middlemore site. One of the things that I'm seeing is happening is that although sustainability is important to counties Manukau, <clears throat> so is money, and I'm finding that I hear people go, oh, well, that might be bumped off because of finances. So I think for me, uh, at the moment, I would say my biggest challenge would be to keep sustainability up there on the priorities of funding and not allow it to be bumped down. Mm. Oh, and I know another issue that a lot of public sector agencies will have is resource and finding resource. And um, I know both of you kind of touched on engagement along different teams and that kind of thing. Do you have any more input on engaging with a wider group to start a green team? So if a public sector agency doesn't have a green team at all? Um, yep. I... <laughs> As a sustainability manager, and if you, if an organisation that doesn't have any green teams whatsoever, um, if you do some publications in the newsletter on screen, whichever way your organisation communicates through, um, and just ask for ideas, people who have got a green um, 
green principles or environmental sustainability principles will send you ideas they go onto your list and then you can grow your list around that person and say well look, do you have anyone else in your department that feels the same about you and just help them to grow their own little target groups and then join the dots cool and then uh teresa asked question regarding measuring impact any advice for how to go about measuring your efforts any handy platform softwares that you've used getting the results assessed by a third party. Austin, I'll let you cover off on that one because it's <laughs> um, a bit more toy two oriented and then Helen, you can cover off as well for maybe creating some sort of module to measure further impact past toy two, but I'll let you cover off that. Yeah, I mean, that's certainly something that we can help with. <laughs> uh, so, um, one of the, the things, I think one of the reasons that potentially uh, the carbon reduce program is being recommended um, and you know, the slide that we can see there where it's, it's a measuring tool apples with apples. Um, so a, a program like ours or any other program that's using a consensus standard, so um, our programs for organizations, they align with ISO 14064 part one, they also align with the GHG protocol, which are the most commonly used ones. And being if you you want to align with those sorts of things, because then you are comparing apples with apples, everyone's sort of on the same page in terms of how you're measuring emissions, what are you the, the way that you're measuring them, what is an accurate and complete inventory look like. Um, and so that's something that that we at Toy2, that's our bread and butter, right? We help organizations measure their emissions, whether or not you want to get certified, we can still help you use the software um, or in the reports to, to produce that inventory and then figure out your plans from there. Um, there's, there's a lot of other options out there. You can certainly do it um, yourself using the guidance from MFE or the GHG protocol is free to access as well. Um, but if you do that yourself, we still really recommend that you get it verified by um, an auditor who's in, um, ideally accredited to uh, verify in line with those standards because then you know you have an accurate and complete assessment. You'd, it'd be really awful if you did the self-assessment and you missed out something, which is very easy to do, and then you're making all these great plans based on a, a false baseline. So um, however you measure it, definitely get it audited. Wonderful. And she just added, um, I should say, coming from a charity view budget conscious, ah, but I yep. feel like you kind of covered off that, but feel free. Yeah, there are some, yeah, there's definitely some free options out there for self-assessment. And then it's just, it just takes time then rather than money. <laughs> yeah. And just to note, we do have our household calculator as well. If you are a really small uh, charity, that could be suitable for you. Um, and we also have our carbon assess tool for smaller businesses and supply chain um, to yeah. mention as well. So we've run out of time today, but thanks so much, Helen and Austin, for speaking. It was really, really amazing material. And to everyone who's still on, um, you'll get the webinar recording sent out to you via email, as well as the resources that both Helen and Austin mentioned. And the next webinar is on February 5th. So we'll be skipping over January because everyone will probably be away on the 5th of January because we're doing normally every first Thursday of the month. We accommodated for Austin's schedule actually this week so she could join in and have a wonderful speaker from Toy2. So that's why it was on okay, Tuesday okay. today. <laughs> um, but so yeah, uh, February 5th at 10 a.m. And we'll send out the link in the next webinar email um, follow-up as well. So we'll see you guys next time. And thanks again for joining. Thank you. See ya. Bye guys. Thank you.